such a waste, such a waste, such a waste. Looking on the city light. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Ken McElroy Show. I'm your host, Daniil, here with Ken. Hey, guys. What's up? I'm having some technical difficulties. I'm trying to sign into YouTube, so bear with me, everybody. You are? I'll keep you posted. Yes. I had no idea. Yes. So why don't you tell them what we did this week? All right. So we had a bunch of fun. So first thing is, um, you guys know we have the Limitless Conference coming up in June. So my business partner and uh, entrepreneur extraordinaire, Tarl Yarber, he uh, came in and uh, stayed at our house, and we basically had a full-on Limitless weekend, going over every single detail, as you need to do. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts, and um, got some cool speakers. Uh, we got a massive venue. We're at the Desert Ridge Marriott this year, which is going to be awesome. We're capped at 2,000 people. Last year, we sold out. So anyway, so it was kind of a limitless weekend. But in the middle of all that, we went to a um, Pace Morby's party, which yeah, was Yeah, that fun. was really fun. Triple digit time. flip. Yeah, he has uh, his season premiere. Uh, our friend Pace Morby has a show on Annie called Triple Digit Flip. And so we went to the premiere. Yeah. That very, was a lot very, of fun, very fun. Right. And it was a 90s hip hop. So I had nothing in my closet. So I went into my son's closet and <laughs> I ended up take, putting out a bunch of his stuff. For that was no, funny. You kind of just. 90s hip hop. It was just hoodies and stuff like that. But it was fun. Yeah. So just so you guys know, I'm going to be communicating under Ken's account because I cannot get in mine because of the password. I don't know what it is. Ah, so I will oh, be Ken the, today. Then we had the Derby party. Yeah, we had a Derby party. So we went from the '90s party to the Derby's party, and that was fun. Um, yep. yep. You just wore your '90s clothes I and did, rocked it out. Everybody had Derby stuff on. I had '90s hip hop. Yeah. So. Well, truthfully, not a lot of people had Derby clothes on because the men didn't tell their wives there was a theme party. That yeah, was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, um. Before we get started, I want to let everyone know I have a webinar with Lisa Song Sutton on Wednesday. Uh, our website is down right now because of GoDaddy, but go to kenmacroy.com forward slash webinar to join. Uh, hopefully, it'll be back up by the end of the show. Um, we're going to be talking about how to start and scale a business. Lisa has done an incredible job at that. For, so for those of you that are looking to start a business or have a business and want to grow it, this will be a great webinar. It's free. So why wouldn't you do it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and then uh, I'll put it here in the show notes, too. So, today we're going to talk. It's going to be pretty wild. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of, um, you know, there's been a lot of internet scams uh, lately. So, okay. So, here's how this came up. Last night at dinner, and I'm not going to mention names. We had a bunch, we had a whole table full of real estate investors, people, influencers, and all that. And we started talking about people, this was real estate based, that are raising money or have raised money in the past um, for scam real estate. And, um, you know, have raised money and, and gotten in trouble for Ponzi's and things like that. We had, we had one person that, ha you know, uh, went over three different deals. I personally have gone over multiple deals with multiple people. I passed on the real estate side, but, um, there's a new one popping up right now that, um, y you know, um, is, has raised money and now, um, he's in, in a bit of trouble. So, so we thought it's interesting how this is also happening in the crypto world. And in the Liver King world, everything. Yeah, so King. let's let's start with Liver King, right? So Jerry, put Liver King on the screen for those that don't know who he is. So this guy is called Liver King, and he made a hundred million dollars last year, and he's been around for about I think ten years now uh, on Instagram. But basically, he was telling everybody he was just eating liver and fruit and working out, and he wasn't taking any steroids. So then he also came out with a supplement brand that that was, you know, freeze dried liver. So people were buying these supplements. And even the guys last night we had dinner with were saying they have friends buying these supplements thinking that this is how this guy's doing it. So it has to be great for me. And uh, anyways, come to find out he's been doing 12 grand a month in steroids that he got busted through some emails that got leaked. Um, but people are shocked. But why are people shocked? Because the guy know. looks like he's done so many steroids. You know what I mean? Like, how could, you know, it, it just shows the power of social influence, right? When, like, somebody's that, um, 
you know, has that many followers, is making that much money, you just believe them, even if your, you know, common sense would tell you otherwise. And I think that that is a big thing is people don't really use common sense when they're looking at this stuff because the people are so well known. I don't understand. Well, they're not well known. They become they're well, well known, known on the internet, yeah, right? Yeah. They become well known. So it, it's an interesting time because you have a lot of people that um, have big, big followings. <laughs> you, and, I have to read that. You got to be careful. What? What do you got? Unicorn said, "Here I was eating raw squirrel liver, and the secret to getting jacked was just steroids." First of all, you can't eat squirrel liver. Come on. <laughs> no, know. he was saying he would eat like he would eat like uh, liver, testicles, like everything. Like that was his thing. Uh, is he just ate raw organs all the time? But uh, but anyway, so what were you saying? Well, I had to read that. No, no, no. <laughs> you keep going. No, but but I think that common sense would tell you otherwise. But people just believe what they aspire to believe right and I, I i think i think this is gonna be more and more prevalent now so i believe because we're starting to see things i'm starting to see things i'm not going to name names where there's been um the the deals are not what they what uh what they were portrayed to be on the on the raising side and i'm talking about real estate now but we're starting to see it on the crypto. We're starting to see it uh, in the influencer world and things like this. Yeah, but let's get into the crypto thing because I think that's interesting too um, as far as all this goes. Because we're going to get into real estate and how this is impacted by real estate. But, you know, you had Sam Bankman fried who everyone knows who he is now with FTX. And FTX, you know, they wanted to sponsor on our channel. And we said no because we didn't understand how their business model yeah, works, I know. you know? And so I think that a lot of people... Um, and they wanted to pay in crypto. Yeah, and they wanted to pay us a lot, you know, of course. Yeah, I know. But but I, of their fake money. But I, um, I think it's interesting because they were giving people an 8% return to basically take their crypto, and they were saying they were holding it. Now, common sense would tell you... <laughs> If somebody's giving you a return on your money of 8% to just hold it, that's obviously not true. They're obviously investing in something that is giving them a bigger than 8% return, which can be risky, right? And Maybe. so, yeah, depending on what it is. But if, first yeah. of all, we all know it's not easy to generate an 8% return in anything. Like, if we could all do that, we would do that. Like, right? Yeah. So I've seen this scam. Um, I've seen it at 8%, 10%, 12% over the years in all kinds of things on businesses. I've seen it in real estate. I've seen it in the crypto world. They, what they do is they, they guarantee in some cases guarantee or estimate or, but they lead with this 8% and that's everybody's for whatever reason, people's brains check out. They're like, okay, I want eight percent, and so, in in this particular case, the only way to pay eight percent is if that asset behind it is producing eight percent. So, in the real estate world, if I have an apartment building that's producing eight percent, in other words, the tenants are paying enough rent, and the expenses are low enough, and the debt is uh, is securely in place and there's cash flow of 8%, then that 8% actually goes back out to the investors. But the asset itself actually pays the 8%. And that's what's missing in so many things is in my opinion, you know, in fact, I, I think uh, I might have told the story before where we had a guy out of Utah that was buying office buildings. And this is going back a little ways. And he said he flew in and he was trying to get Ross, my partner and I, to invest in these office buildings. And so, of course, being real estate guys, we're, we're so, okay, so show me the contracts, show me the, the, the numbers, show me the locations, you know, and, and you start to get into the details. He didn't have any of it. And he was raising money with, with promising an 8% return and what he was really doing was raising more money to pay the 8%. And that uh, basically well, is a Ponzi. Right. That was the Ponzi. But on, on FTX, I think they were more um, investing in things that were riskier than... Were they? Or were they... 8%. Or were they... Was the money piling in and were they using that to pay out? I think they were doing a little bit of both. But yeah. I think that they originally... They weren't... They think they were just investing in things because it's when the market 
corrected is when they had the problem. But the point is, is 8% uh, needs to be distributed. Right. That's the point. So so if, if, that, if your money is being invested in something that's producing 8%, it works. Right. But if it's not, but and we, then it's based on new money paying out, paying the old money. But I guess my point is, is that we, you know, we're talking to some guys last night at dinner about this as well. And they were intelligent guys. They're real estate investors. They're younger. They're probably in their thirties, but they were saying that, uh, like the one guy said, he goes, I, I knew like, you know, he goes, I just, everyone was doing it. So I figured, you know, like it's got to be legit because everybody's doing it. And I think that there's a lot of this going on now with like real estate influencers and other influencers as people think, well, it's almost like back in the day when like somebody would drive a really nice car and you're like, oh, they have to be doing well because they have a nice car or they have a big house and, you know, you see them on American Greed or whatever, right? <laughs> but it's like same thing because it's like they have all these followers and they wouldn't have all these followers if, you know, they didn't have a good deal or good, you know, a, you know, a sound business plan. But really, it's just, it's two separate things. No, it is. And I've seen this before. I mean, we had a guy in, in my high school that started a carpet business, carpet installation business, and he was raising money from people and lots of, uh, actually, he actually met with my parents and they passed, but he, he was raising money and he was hardly doing any work. What he was doing was raising money to pay. You, what, what, what you do is you're, when the Ponzi stops is when they can't raise money to pay the old money. Right. So that's that's essentially what happened in this particular case. Th this particular case is a little bit different, but you know, people piling on like a dog pile. You know, like the, when you're a kid, you know, uh, it, it, you want to be early on, like well, as the prices are going up. But there's no asset. Right. That's the thing. So, so what is actually paying the eight percent? That's the lesson. There. What is the asset? And what's actually paying the eight percent? It's possible that somebody can take money and and generate over an eight percent return it's possible and of course pe lots of people have done this but that underlying uh, principle actually is the only thing uh that that can pay uh that back right and i think the other the other issue is um you know the regu regulations you know yeah. like uh, the regulatories you know like I was reading like, you know, crypto doesn't want to be regulated. Right. Right. So um, and so it's not. And so one of the things that protects people now with real estate syndications, as an example, you know, there's a bunch of governmental bodies that protect the investor and they should protect the investor. But you still got to be careful because you can still invest in a bad deal. And if you still get scammed, doesn't mean you're not going to lose your money. It just means that those people will get prosecuted. Um, and people keep mentioning different and asking if we're going to talk about certain uh, real estate investors or whatever. And we're not going to mention any names. We're just going to you know, keep it high level because we don't know. But um, but you do have to be careful. Well, and, and they're under investigation, um, right. but, which means that uh, they haven't uh, there hasn't been due process yet. Exactly. So I don't want to get into a situation where, you know, they're being investigated and uh, they're up. Uh, with charges, but, uh, you know, nothing's, nothing's final yet. Exactly. And so, and Mike wanted to know, um, what fraud you were referencing in the early two thousands. I think the guy was on American greed, wasn't he? Uh, which one? The one you were just talking about. Where oh. he went in. Well, I mean, uh, you know, um, I can actually, I can actually say his name because he was prosecuted and I think he might be in prison. His name was Wayne Palmer and, um, he was out of Salt Lake city. And, um, you know, uh, he flew in to pitch us a deal and we passed because we couldn't make sense of the deal. He wanted money, but he had, um, we couldn't, we couldn't figure out how our money was going to make money. So we've invested with lots of people over the years, you know, in lots of businesses and lots of things. And typically you go back to the asset, you know, what's the revenue, what's the expenses, what actually gets uh, produced, you know, as as the return, and that's what's distributed. So we couldn't tie it all the way back. So we passed on this particular case. But I had friends that um, got involved in this. Yeah, I had friends that lost a lot of money in this because he was he was going around and he was trying to um, raise capital from whoever would listen, basically, you know. 
And, um, you know, I don't know everyone that was involved, but I know a lot of people that were and, and they lost all their money and he ended up going to prison. And, um, I remember seeing an article, it was, uh, in the, it was a hundred million dollars at the time, which is a lot of money. And, um, you know, the, they, uh, they came in and raided and got all the stuff and took all his computers and all that stuff. And, you know, it ended up being a long process. He ended up getting, uh, convicted. Yeah. And I think what's really important here is how, how can we help people uh, not fall for a scam? Right. So if people are looking to invest in real estate, like what are some things that they need to look out for, um, well, to know if it's a scam? Yeah, To me, it's the entire purpose of this whole channel. Honestly, mm -hmm. it really is. It's, 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 purely education it's purely understanding how to ask the right questions and seeing things for what they are one of the reasons that i personally don't invest in the stock market right now is because i don't understand it you know i don't understand how a business cannot be making any money and the stock price can go crazy you know it has to be because of the demand of the people and the marketing and all that stuff driving the stock price up you, you know i you know, it, it certainly doesn't follow earnings because, again, just going right back to an apartment building, if an apartment building, you got income, you got expenses, and you got debt, and there's cash flow. That cash flow against that investment is the return. So, you know, I always just keep going back to the asset itself. And what happens is hype and, you know, people start piling on. And next thing you know, you know, it's gotten really out of control, right? Yeah, and I, I think one of the things you always say to look for too is if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So I think that's like a big overall lesson. Like like Liver King, you know, saying that he takes liver and uh, fruit and he gets that jacked, too good to be true. FTX, 8% return, no risk, too good to be true. You know, if a syndicator or somebody is promising you this big return that's guaranteed, think if it feels like it's too good to be true it, it just almost always is i just uh, you know i always say trust but verify you know and i and i i i have lots of friends that turn to me and and say hey what do you think of this investment and guys i've lost money in gold mines i've lost money in oil and gas i you know i invested in oil and gas well that didn't exist like <laughs> right. if you can imagine like you know so these are you know I've been burned and now I know better, you know, okay, what could I have done differently? Um, was it misrepresented? Of course. And was the person who brought it to me misrepresented? Of course. But there are things that you can do um, to, to actually verify if, if there's a real asset there. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think also, you know, me and you have talked about sticking to what you know, right? Or learning something else, but you have to understand it. You can't invest in something that you don't, at least on the basis, are able to understand, right? They, they should have a business plan that you can verify and you can make sure, you know, the oil well exists or, you know, whatever yeah. the thing is, you know? And so just, it's really important, yeah. I feel like, so, to, to do yeah, that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll give you guys some great examples. You know, we have a lot of investors and... I just met with one this morning for coffee. Um, and, you know, they, they'll they actually go to the physical property, uh, which is smart. You know, they don't go. Um, so when we put out a property, we have investors that will go there, make sure it's a real property. Now, obviously, they want to check it out and all that stuff. And I don't think that they're questioning whether or not, that you know, we're, we're, we're raising money without investing it into a property. But there are investors that are very active and very thorough and do a due diligence on us. And, um, and by the way, that is what you should be doing. Yeah. And then there are others that we've never met. Right. And, you know, they wire the money and, um, you know, I'm just seeing the, you know, how thorough are you as you are starting to invest? And I've had these, I've done this mistake myself. Right. You know, and, and I think we all have. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And, you know, like we even watch those American greed shows, you know, and it's like some of the scams are really obvious and then other ones are really elaborate, you know, but you really just need to to dig in and question. Well, I'll tell you, like, I think that a lot of times, you know, Wall Street's kind of set everyone up for this and, and hear me out. You know, they don't want you to, you know, when you when you're investing your money with a wealth manager, or a financial planner. And then they're investing your money into things that, you know, are marketed well to them. 
Do you really know like what's in a mutual fund that you're investing? Do you really understand like where your money really is in these big portfolios that you might have in your retirement plan, your savings plan, your pension plan or whatever it is? You may or may not, you know, in your 401k plan, uh, you know, the way it's all set up, it's so far out of reach. You don't even know how to ask the right question about a mutual fund because they have so many different things that are all pieced together. Um, you know, I know they're measured and they're indexed and all that kind of stuff, but um, at the end of the day, do you really know? Right. And so I think that, uh, you know, specifically the American public is so used to just turning over their money to other people that, um, and that's the opposite of what we're trying to teach on this channel. Absolutely. And I, a couple of things. One, make sure you hit the like button. If you're liking the content really helps us out. We love that. Uh, secondly is, um, Mike had a, Mike O'Connor had a good question and it kind of pertains. He said, what's the best way to buy gold and silver in your opinion? Because uh, I feel like uh, this is one of those things that can be a scam. So what's not a scam is physical gold. <laughs> that's what so Ken likes. That's yeah. all I ever have. So I've never bought an E. TF or EFT or, or read or what? No. In other words, so if you think of gold, I always like to draw this this uh, this pyramid here. So um, one, two, three. So if you take a look at this here, so number one, that's land and gold. Number two is a gold company. Number three is a gold stock. Okay, so. You know, you think about it, everything's a derivative of gold. So so if you have physical gold and you have a coin and you put it in your pocket and you fly from, let's say, Phoenix is where we are, to London, you can take that gold coin and convert it to euros. So that's physical gold, you know, and of course there's a spot price and all that stuff. And, you know, I'm not a gold guy, uh, but I do follow it. Um, the the next piece is the gold company that you can invest in and the next piece is the gold stock or even and now for, even though they have ETFs from there there's more ETFs there's more paper than there is actual physical gold so you know I do know enough to know that if I'm going to have gold then I'm going to want it to be physical gold and um, I personally don't look at gold as an investment I look at it as a way to hedge the U.S. dollar or inflation. So um, now I do, you know, there's gold is very complex. Uh, we had Mike Maloney on the show. Um, I think we did we did some stuff with him or a podcast. And so uh, he has a book, uh, you know, it's called uh, Investing in Gold and Silver. Uh, I would read that book. It's very, very, very good. And there's all kinds of really nice nuggets in that book to talk about how to buy gold. But Mike specifically was the one who taught me that if you're going to get gold or silver, get physical and that way you have it. And, and at the end of the day, when you start to see some of these economies um, collapse their currency, like in Venezuela, let's say, or Zimbabwe, at the end of the day, having that physical gold is worth a lot because that, that now you have something to barter with as opposed to paper dollars or, you know, something, you know, that can go poof. And do you buy that gold just from like a local retailer? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So I end up finding uh, gold is hard to find right now. And, and the way I found it is I found a, a local guy and, um, you know, he's a, he's a gold bug and he has a, uh, you know, a, a dealership, um, but he gets them through estates. So let's say somebody passes away and they're trying to cash out the estate or whatever. So he'll get gold that, that is, that is, um, um, you know, delivered and then he pays him back in cash and now he has gold and, and you know there's a there's a normal exchange there i do know um uh, i don't know enough about um you know the mint and i know the mint right now is backed up a little bit and and i'm not exactly sure what's going on around that but um i do know that um that's how my guy his name's jerry gets it and then so he'll call me and say hey you know, I got some more in. You want any, right? And so yeah. I'm on his list. And, and so I'll go down there and, you know, snag some. But I personally, that's what I do. Yeah. And then we, and then you can like run a place where you can keep it all. Yeah, and all yeah, that yeah, stuff. yeah. And then, you know, we have a offsite storage for, you know, for that kind of stuff. So that's important. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you want, you know, um, that not in a 
a safe deposit box in a bank. Yeah, right. But in, you know, there's plenty of places offsite storage uh, that that um, uh, you know can, you can house that stuff. Absolutely. Um, so Dan said that he got scammed in the restaurant business and it was his fault because he did not pay attention to the red flags. And that's what I, I feel like there always is. Right? Like when we watch like American Greed or any of those shows, like there's almost always red flags. People just kind of push them under the rug because they're making money. Yeah. And I found that the times that I've been burned um, and I have been has been where I, I didn't take the time and to really ask the right questions and and to get thorough. You know, I did with Wayne. Um, I avoided that one because real estate for me is something that I'm very, very fluent in. But in some of the other things, as you start getting into tech or you start getting into, let's say, a restaurant business or you start getting into gold or oil and gas, you know, things can be a little bit more elusive. And that's where you build your network, you know, of people that you can call and, and ask the right questions because they're, they're a little bit different. But at the end of the day, there has to be an asset. So like in my oil and gas, you know, there obviously needed to be a well. <laughs> but even if there was a well, um, it produces what it produces. There's data and all the stuff around that. And then, you know, you should be able to calculate that into your return. Yeah, and you don't really like the um, the guaranteed return, like the high guaranteed returns either, right? Well, I found that they're usually, when people do that, it's it's a way to raise money. Right. So that's what you start to see. When you start to see these big, big, per, big percentages, um, they're usually uh, somebody that's trying to raise capital. Okay. So we're going to hop into our inner circle questions. Um, make sure you guys sign up for the inner circle if you want to be able to ask Ken a question. He answers every single one. And we also do monthly happy hours and buy monthly book clubs. So you go to kensinnercircle.com to register. And Jerry, can you put the link up, please? Yep. Um, on the in the typed area. And then uh, also make sure you like the show. It really helps us out. And let's jump into our first question. All right. So Eric is asking, I understand that you have been through multiple market cycles. How would or did you invest in hardship times when cap rates were pushed higher coupled with higher interest rates? So um, to explain that, that means prices were pushed higher, right? With higher interest rates. So cap, higher cap rates means lower prices. Okay. And higher interest rates means lower cash flow. Okay. Typically. You know, not in all cases, but that's generally what I think he's asking. So um, There's a little bit more. Okay. I know that the 80s were a hard time for making things pencil out, but investors were still buying at that time. I've asked some older investors and received some interesting feedback, such as renting or a per room basis. So how would you approach and make deals pencil out in times like these? Well, it's a great question because this is the time where people need to get super creative. So um, it's interesting. I did a video Friday and I talk about the power of property management. And it was interesting. I read some of the comments and some of the people were like, now, you know, now it's not the time to turn over, you, you know, your property to property management because now's the time for you to do it. The issue is not, um, you know, who the issue is how experienced are you and what do you see? So for me, a property manager, a good one, is going to see these other income, these other income opportunities. They're going to see these ways to reduce expenses, and and um, the novice is is going to is going to do it themselves to save money. Um, and uh, you know, it's possible that they can do it, but uh, there is only one way, and that is you know how do you how do you manage a property the best that it can be. Uh, you have to know all the ways that you can generate revenue, income, maintain your high occupancy, collect the highest amount of rent, uh, lower your delinquency, you know, turn your units quickly so you're minimizing vacancy. All of those things um, are important. And, and uh, that's what I meant by having a good property manager to help you assist with that. You know, you know, 20, 30 years in the business, you learn a lot of things. Um, I'm not promoting property management, but I was try I think that some people misunderstood the point I was trying to make. And, and that is, is that um, during times like this, you got to turn to people that have been through times like this and, and know how to make money and know how to make uh, the most money they can. There are lots of ways 
to monetize a, re a rental property a lot. Um, one that you own already. And there's a lot of ways to, to minimize the expenses. There's a lot. And, you know, and they're, they're, they're all long conversations, you know, from property tax appeals to insurance and, and looking at the individual coverages and the deductibles. Um, there's a zillion ways to, to manage utilities. Um, there's a zillion ways to manage the supply chain things and, and be able to buy in bulk uh, through um, co-op groups and bigger uh, uh, collaborations and things like that. There's a bunch of things that do, you know, and a good property management company has been through this before and they've had these, a lot of these issues where they've had high inflation and problems and had to turn to other alternatives. So, um, you know, and that's what I was trying to say moving into this next period of time is uh, people that are going to get creative um, and um, are going to figure out every single way that they can. But the one thing that will never change is that you can never raise rent more than the market, period. So that's well, one of the big things. Well, one thing that concerns me about this question is I feel like he's trying to make a deal work. And I think that when you try too hard to make a deal work that maybe doesn't work is when you can get in trouble and you could find somebody that can tell you something's going to work because that's a good they point. want your business. Yeah. It's kind of like the Airbnb business, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, obviously every, you know, let's, let's just start off. First, it's a single family home with, with two people in it. Then it's a single family home with a renter. Now it's a single family home that's furnished and they're trying to do short term rentals. You know, it's a whole different business. If if the Airbnb uh, model, the income doesn't uh, work, does it work as a renter? And, um, you know, that's I think that's actually what I think a lot of people are going to be faced with next year as we're starting to see a softness in many Airbnb markets. So you know, some people bought some really expensive houses and, and, you know, so it does work one way and we are starting to see cracks like that now, you know, but in order for that to work, you need eight or $10,000 a month of income, let's say, whereas maybe the thing only rents for three or four. And so does it work at three or four? And, and so, um, to your point, you, you know, you, you have to have, um, you have to have a strategy to make sure that it cash flows, um, you know, at, at its, at its lowest form. Absolutely. So Gary from the inner circle wants to know, we just bought our first multifamily rents are under market and we just did an adjustment to them, uh, to make them 10 to 15% below market. So they up the rents to make them 10 to 15% below market. They're all month to month. What's the appropriate time to raise rates, raise the rents again? We'd like to be about 5% below market to stay full. So he basically wants to raise another 10%. So he sure. raised 10 to 15. Now right. he's taking a break. Everybody's month to month. When does he raise them again? So the first thing I would tell you is that you're highly exposed by having everyone month to month. That means that everyone can move out in a month. Right. So that to me is a big red flag. So and by the way, it also on the other side of it allows you to be able to raise everybody but you also have more risk there. So let's say you have 12 units. Um, the, what we would do is I would, I would set it up so I have 12 leases uh, expiring in one of each month. So you have one expiring in January, one in February, one in March. So you wanna spread out your lease expiration risk. That's really, really important because so so now you're just dealing with one person in January as opposed to 12, let's say. So um, the other thing is, um, you know, for us, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with being just below the market. Being just below the market means that you might have a better retention. So in other words, if you if, if let's say their rents uh, two thousand dollars and you're at eighteen hundred you might uh, not want to go to $2,000 because they have lots of options at $2,000. So if you keep it at 18 or just go to 1850 or 19, then as they go out and look around at the $2,000 options, they might say, you know, it's a pretty good deal. We're going to stay. We're still saving a little bit. So, so depending on your hold period, um, which I'm hoping is a long-term hold, you're probably just going to want to manage to cash flow as opposed to just trying to chip away at those rent increases. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. Um, and but then when, um, 
How long until he can raise them again, though? Would you say? Well, on a month to month, there's you know it's there. You're not subject to any lease, right. so y- you know you, you can raise it the next month. the The issue is, um, what's the tenant going to do? Right. So you know what what restricts a lease increase uh, is the lease. Mm-hmm. Or what was what restricts a rent increase is the lease, the term of the lease. So it also protects the tenant, which is also good. Um, so it can be a win-win. Typically, in addition to that, we as a company disincentive month to month. So we'll charge one hundred dollars more a month just for the ability to be month to month because we don't want it. Well, that's maybe something that he can do, right? He can, um, you know, raise everybody's rent a little bit in a couple months. But then if they, you know, do a six month lease or a 12 month lease, he can make it a little bit cheaper. Or if they're going to do month to month, it goes a little bit more expensive. Yeah. So, yeah, what you want to do is spread out your 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 risk of everybody moving out. Oh, I can't imagine that having 12 properties all up at once. Well, it could happen if they're Mm -hmm. all month to month. Yeah. And you raise rents and there you could have half of them go, you know, I'm going to go somewhere else. Now you got, you know, all the you're scrambling. So, you, you know, just spread your time and your risk over a period of time so that you're only dealing with one a month, let's say. But then in addition to that, I personally sleep better at night when my tenants are in a lease. I think they do because they know what their number is. Um, and then you let the market prove out what the real rent is at the end of that lease. It might be lower. Right. Right. Absolutely. So make sure you hit the like button if you're enjoying this content. Really would help us out. We're at 63. Let's try to get to 100. We can do it. Uh, and then secondly is join my webinar on Wednesday with Elisa Song Sutton. Can't sign up right now because the, the site is down. But remember, people, when you had to write down things, uh, Jerry told me that right before the show. So go to kemacroy.com forward slash webinar. She's going to show you. She started so many businesses, real estate and otherwise. She's a great resource. She can tell you how to start a business, how to scale a business. Uh, it's at five o'clock uh, Arizona time, mountain time. So make sure you sign up. Nice. All right. Let's keep getting into these questions. They're good today. All right. Uh, Hector has a question. He says, thank you for all that you do. Given the high cost to build, I have the option to build 12 apartments on a mobile home. So he already has some mobile homes and he has some more land. So he can build 12 apartments on a one acre lot, or I can add utilities and a septic to the one acre, which will allow me to add 13 more mobile home units to the existing park. The apartments would bring in more rent in the long run, but the mobile homes would generate cash flow more quickly. What would Ken McElroy do? Ah, good question. Um, well, a couple things. One, um, thank you. Well, it sounds to me like you get one more mobile home. So it's it's a math issue for me. So I don't know what your rent uh, is going to be in the mobile home. I, um, I do like the mobile home play because it's affordable and I think we're heading into um, some affordability issues Um, so I do like that but on the other hand if you build something new it's going to be class A (laughs) you know make no mistake about it I mean you're going to build something you know today you're not going to build a B it's like you're going to build might be a minus but it's going to be nice and your rents are going to be significantly different and higher priced um, so I don't know what your market is, um, in that particular, um, uh, in, in where you are, but, um, you know, so you got to take a look at the pricing, uh, but also I know construction costs because we're in the middle of it are quite expensive. And also you're going to have a, uh, variable rate loan on that construction. So that is a risk too. You don't know how high rates are going to go. Um, so there's a lot of variables. I have to look at the math. And uh, the other thing is, is you got to look at the long term play here. Right. So as it stands, um, you know, if if the mobile homes and the apartments are close financially, then because I know you can also buy a mobile home a lot less and you can have it up and running quickly. So you just got to put it there on a pad. Um, and it sounds like you can do that rather quickly. You know, an apartment community can take a year to two years to, to, to complete. So you got that two year period 
and um and all all the risks that i just mentioned so um you know I think overall, you just got to look at the actual math. Well, and Casey brought up a good point. They said, but people who can afford to pay a higher price, he said, would people who can afford to pay a higher price want to be next to a mobile home? No offense to mobile home peeps, yep. just a reality. Oh, yeah, yeah. I thought about that. That's another thing to consider. You know, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's a it's a heck of an idea. It's, it's, it's only an acre, but if you can get 13 on there quickly, um, you know, don't forget, like a lot of uh, apartment guys, um, you know, buy up mobile home parks and put apartments on them later. Right. That happens all the time. So I, I think that, you know, that's always an option for you. But, um, you, you know, uh, if you can get I, I, I don't know what the cost of a mobile home is right now. I'm sure it's gone up with with the economy and what's happening. But I, I'm positive it's significantly less than building something. So, you know, you just got to look at the math. Absolutely. And, you know, you should, you know, after talking to you and Kathy last night, Kathy Fetke, you know, who's a good friend of ours, you know, construction costs her a lot more than you think they are right now. And that's coming from two people that are very yeah. skilled at yep. this. Yep. So now might not be a great time to try to build something. And you could always build later. You could put the septic in, get everything on there, you know, wait for, you know, uh, rates to go down because it doesn't sound like there would be a loan if you're just throwing a, a septic tank on there and you know putting some pads down and then also just for construction costs and labor costs and everything to go down yeah you can always do it later I mean, yeah. that's a beautiful thing absolutely the, the other piece is if it's a long-term hold um you know you can always do it at some you know at some future point exactly um, Sarah has a question. She said, Hey, Ken and Daniil, Sarah here. What is the benefit of scaling up to a multi-unit building or apartment building in a complex versus having multiple single family rentals with no mortgages? When I run the numbers of having a multi multi-family building, it seems like less of a headache to just have that versus a whole bunch of single family rentals. Um, we're trying to decide if we want to scale up from our single family uh, rentals to an apartment building. Sure. Well, the one thing I heard her say was single family rentals with no mortgages, I, I think is what yeah. I heard. Mm -hmm. So obviously those are no brainers. That's what this one does here. <laughs> she doesn't <laughs> like mortgages. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so I, I, the only way to compare that is a, is a multi-tenant building with no mortgage. So, you know, to all things being equal. Um, you know, the thing about a multi-tenant building is uh, it, it, it's, um, if, if you have, um, uh, you, you're going to have lower operating costs for sure. And, and you got one focus. Uh, I don't know that um, you would have to sell any of those, you, you know, um, what, what, you know, some of, some of the stuff that we teach here is that you don't actually need money to buy multifamily. You just need a great deal. And then you can put the money together unless you're partner averse um, and you don't want to do that. But, um, you know, there's massive advantages to having one multi-tenant building. Um, you know, it's easier to sell. It's easier to 1031. It's easier to manage, um, you, you know, and you're, you, I think you're, I know your operating costs are, are probably less. Your rents might not be less uh, or, or you're probably less too. I mean, it's uh, that a single family homes, depending on what kind of single family home you have. But, um, you know, your CapEx, all that stuff, if you aggregate them all, you're going to find that everything's going to be a little bit less and more efficient in the multi-tenant uh, uh, property. Uh, you know, you're going to direct all your efforts there, you know, all your marketing efforts and all your management efforts and all that kind of stuff, as opposed to all over all over the place. Um, but if you've got a bunch of single families with no mortgages, I don't think that's a bad position at all. Yeah, because, you know, the one thing with single family is, you know, they're – they're in demand, you know, they're yeah. building a lot of apartment buildings, they're building a lot of condos, but single family homes, I mean, you know, they're, yeah. for the most part, they're in demand. And also, um, you know, you're, you're going to get rid of things that are cash flowing and doing well for you and invest yeah. in something I'd that be, you don't know. And I, I you know, multifamily is hotter than hot right now. And it's not the time to, to, to be jumping in. It's a great question. Uh, it's something to really look at, but I would say in the next year to two, it's not an arena that you want to play in because uh, I think prices are too high. 
Um, and you know, it's just, um, very, very, very competitive at the moment. And if you've got those cash flowing assets sitting in those, those houses, you know, I would just be super content with that. And by the way, you could still do multifamily and, and still have those. You don't have to sell one to get another. Yeah. I mean, I know people that raise money for deals all the time, Sarah. So I know you're always on the channel and I know you can do yeah. it. So just find a good yeah. deal and then you can find people that will invest in it. Yeah. I don't sell anything to buy anything. Right. Ever. Only only sell something if it's just not really working out. Yeah. If you don't, if it's, it's a bad area or you're having a tough time keeping it full or it's you know there's a big capital issue coming up on it or property taxes went up or you know whatever then that's the time to cut an investment but not if it's doing really well for you absolutely um just so you guys remember i'm uh responding under ken's name today so a lot of people are saying thanks ken for the answer but you're clearly not typing so it's clearly not you it's me so i don't know how to type i couldn't log into mine today um so Jason wants to know, what's your thought on investing in multi-tenant industrial buildings that have about a thousand square foot uh, warehouse space with a small office in each one? Yeah. So I have one. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I flip and love those little things, you know? Yeah. I use it. I store cars in it. And, you know, we have our, I have a book publishing company. We have books in there. Uh, we don't really use the front uh, much, but, you know, I think these small little businesses, you, you know, uh, in my little industrial park that we're in, there's all kinds of really cool uh, folks in there. You know, we got a car detailer. We got a guy that does um, um, the wraps. Uh, you know, remember where we got the car wrap? Oh, yeah, that was awesome. Um, you got a carpet company. You know, we got a, well, you know, there's just like, we have a dance studio in there. So I like that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, it does depend on, um, you know, <laughs> how vibrant uh, the market is. So, um, you know, I also have, uh, I have friends that have owned these and they can't get anybody to rent in there either. Uh, so the economy, uh, you know, those small little businesses have to be supported. Uh, but the warehouse space is gold right now. So, uh, you, you know, and I think it will be for a while. People are looking for places to store stuff and, um, uh, so, you know, I like them, but again, it all boils down to the math and, uh, you know, every, every, um, every industrial park and every city and every county is very, very different from a math standpoint. Yeah. I mean, but industrial, you know, it's probably going to do pretty well. It has yeah. and it will continue to do well. And, and, uh, I love our little bit. I've had it for 10, 12 years now and I've had all kinds of stuff in there. I love just having that big extra space. Yep, absolutely. And on YouTube people, make sure you ask questions too. We'll try to get to some of your questions as well. So Catherine from the Inner Circle wants to know, we're working on getting our first property ready for rent in Bisbee, Arizona. Up until this time, they've done fix and flips. Is there a great um, an online service for her to help set up like an LLC? And then what do you think about the Bisbee market? Yeah, so... Um, LLCs are quite simple these days, you know, they're, um, uh, you know, I, you, you should be able to do it for just a few hundred dollars. I, don't know, I mean, eh, right. Eh, Is that like more seven, eight, nine hundred. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. But, but you know what? It, it's worth it. Cause it's a one time deal, right? Yeah. Just get it set up properly. Cause I've done this where I've paid to get it set up. Then frugal Danielle tried to do it on her own one time through like, I don't know, one of those online services did it wrong, was all messed up. I ended up having to pay to get it redone anyways, which cost just as much. And then I had to pay to get it canceled because now it's like a registered LLC that's set up incorrectly. So just, just pay it. It's yeah. a one-time deal. Just pay it. Yeah. There's, yeah. Uh, I always, uh, I refer, uh, uh, Garrett Sutton, uh, www.sutlawlaw.com, you know, and, and he'll register it in Wyoming. So part of it is your registration, you know, there are registration fees um, in different states or different costs. So like California is, is amongst the highest, New York's amongst the highest. So, you know, there's a there's a bunch of compliance and stuff that around the LLC that uh, um, and that that uh, uh, that come with the LLC itself. Um, and so uh, all of that stuff needs to be considered. But, uh, I, you know, I would just go to uh, Sut Law and just, you know, and 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 do that you definitely want to put 
this asset inside of that LLC for sure. I don't, I haven't been to Bisbee in a while, so I don't know what the market's like today. Um, so unfortunately, I can't comment on that specific market. But um, I'm sure that there's all kinds of data out there uh, through the Economic Development Office and through some of the realtors on, um, and even local uh, people that own apartments in the area and or single family rentals. The, I've always found that once you once you start to network, you're going to get lots of really good information and data about employers coming or going or all that kind of stuff. So those are the things, obviously, that, that you know. I'm glad you're doing it, but um, if there's no renters, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so, right. Exactly. Um, I have a question, you know, because kind of coming up on YouTube. Um, how long do, does it take? How long do you guys spend on underwriting a deal? Would you say like a multifamily deal? Um, and how many people? <laughs> uh, it, it takes us uh, less than an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Of a team of how many, though? Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> well, okay. So, like, take a look. If a deal comes in, the first thing we do is talk to the broker and we get all the information. Then you have to look through that. You have to look through the rent roll, the financials, all the kind of stuff. Look for inconsistencies. Then you got to go out and get a debt quote. And then you really should visit the property, but we don't always visit them when we're making an offer. Um, because, um, you know, uh, we can do that after if we if it's accepted and then we start our due diligence and you know you've got capex issues and all that kind of stuff so i have a team now of course so like if i'm buying a property in dallas i just call some of our people that live in dallas and have them go buy it and you know and then we have a you know kind of a set of, of things that we want them to look at and um and then so the team itself um uh, really it's just a few people yeah but a few people and, yeah right, so mm -hmm. it takes a while yep um, and then box pal wanted to know the author of the name of the book, investing in gold and silver you were talking about. Oh, Mike Maloney. Um, yep. It, you can get it on, um, rdapress.com. Right, and that's uh, the the name, the exact name. Um, I'm, I'm you're kind of, you're a little sketchy on titles sometimes. So maybe just type in like gold and silver book, Mike Maloney. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what it is right here. Mike Maloney is his name for sure. He's did Jerry, we did a podcast with him. Oh, it hasn't come out yet. So, um, so, um, yeah, Mike Maloney. Um, so yeah, so the video, sorry guys. Yeah, it's called The Guide to Investing in Gold and Silver. And here it is right here. So it's out on Wednesday? Um, no, this book's out. Oh, okay, that one's out. Um, so that's a great book. Um, Mike's a good friend. He lives in Puerto Rico. Um, and, um, he's got another book coming out. And so we interviewed him, uh, and, um, he's having a tough time getting it printed. <laughs> so, well, so are we with our book. Cause somebody else was actually asking about our book, uh, ABCs of, um, raising yeah, capital and crazy, yeah, it's guys. just going to take some like, time. Paper and like everything's like, it's been nuts, like the supply chain. So yeah, Mike, Mike finished the book he's written, but I uh, can't get it out right now. And so this happened a lot. It happened to Ed Milet. You know, with his book um, um, that he has recently, he was saying he was having a tough time getting it printed. So it happens. Yep. So we have a question. It's a really good question from JTS on YouTube. And there, he's saying, uh, since you're connected to Pace Morby, what's your take on seller financing? I'm negotiating a seller financing deal on a small outdoor hospitality center. Yeah. So guys, like seller financing is real. So explain uh, what it is. Well, it's, not it's, knows. yeah, let's say you own something, you, uh, you know, and I'm trying to buy it. Um, instead of me going to the bank, you finance it. That's it. I mean, it's, and you, by the you're way, assuming their mortgage. So you're getting their rate that well, they have. Well, if there is a mortgage. Yeah. 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 Yes. But yeah, normally. Yeah. yeah. So there, you know, you, you know, you don't have to assume their mortgage, but there's, there are ways, there's so many ways to buy a property from the seller, you know, you actually are actually. Um, so there are some sellers that actually want to not uh, have a big capital gain. Right. And so maybe they want to have some kind of a payup. The seller is still in control. So it's not, if you can, it's not a bad thing to have a seller, um, um, you know, sell to you because, um, and of course this is all negotiable. 
So seller financing, there's no, you know, there's no one um, uh, way, but um, it, it's, it's, it's real. I, I mean, the only difference is, is um, instead of, uh, you, you know, instead of the seller financing the sale, you're bring, getting the money from somewhere else. So a sale is a sale. Um, and then if you default, the seller gets the, the real estate back. So I have a lot of friends that have, um, you know, it's called seller carrybacks, seller financing. You know, it's just part of creating financing. It's all in the same big bucket. So, uh, yes, I, I think that if you can do that, you should do that. Yeah. The, the, one, the one risk to the, per, the buyer is that if the seller declares bankruptcy, the property can be taken because it's still in the seller's name until you finish paying. So that is the one risk. Um, so you definitely want to know whoever you're buying from that they're not over there in shambles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's obviously you're going to want to engage an attorney that knows, understands how to do all this stuff and make sure that you're protected for sure. Yeah. And, and Jason had a question on tax base. Um, that's more of a question for Eric. Uh, he said, you know, if um, what is you it? get that if they get the property back on a seller financing deal, oh. what's how does the tax base work at that point? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's that, a that's a that's above my pay grade. Yeah, like yeah, that's why we have you know CPAs yeah. and different things. So um, I do know this uh, during the last uh, you know because I uh, I saw this happen to friends of mine uh, back in 08, 09. Remember when everybody you know uh, let their houses go and they went back to the bank? They ended up having a tax hit, right, Jerry? Wasn't that right? Yeah, 1099. They got a 1099 for um, uh, for the debt, right? So if, let's say uh, I think it was the difference between what the bank got rid of it for and what they. Um, so let's say let's say you owe 200 grand to the bank and you gave the house back, and they sold it for 150 to someone else, and you got a 50,000. That's a 50,000 um, uh, dollar uh, tax, or. Uh, income yeah yeah they showed his income so there are some complications with that so you know just be aware yeah and then uh, jts wanted to follow up with that he said would on the seller financing would five percent interest only for five years be aggressive i think whatever the seller will give you <laughs> yeah right? yeah if you could do that that'd be awesome you know i mean if you can get a five percent loan from a seller by the way that might come with a higher price mm-hmm you know, you just got to look at the math. So obviously a 5% in today's rate, uh, today's market would be uh, better than the market. Absolutely. So, well, thanks everybody for joining. Um, we are seven likes away from hitting the hundred goals. So let's do it. And hopefully I see you guys on Wednesday at the webinar, kenmacquare.com yeah, forward slash guys. webinar, write it down, sign up. Don't try to memorize it. You'll forget and <laughs> sign up later today once the website's working. All right. Thanks, everybody. Happy Monday, guys. See you.